Well, hello, everyone. Um, just seeing people arriving, uh, giving people a few minutes just to get into this uh, this meeting. But um, welcome to this fourth of the fifth of the five part series of the Money uh, Macro Finance uh, policy, policy Conference, where we're going to be focusing on uh, fiscal policy and climate, though I suspect we might drift into uh, a broad array of different economic issues. Um, my name is Joe Paisley. I'm the president of the GARP Risk Institute. That's the thought leadership arm of the Global Association of Risk Professionals. And for those of you who don't know it, and I'm sure that not all of you will have heard of GARP, uh, we're a global membership organization for risk professionals, and we focus on risk management and advancing best practices globally. And um, over the last three years or so, we've spent a lot of time thinking about climate risk and sustainability um, and how to embed it within day to day risk management. And, and that's because we believe it needs to come out of this pure corporate social responsibility into the mainstream way that companies are thinking about risk. Uh, and we also see that there are very real financial risks associated with climate, um, particularly the transition to a lower carbon economy. Now, a big part of the toolkit that uh, we all need to start to think more about is climate scenario analysis, which is arguably, I would say, more challenging than standard macroeconomic scenario analysis, uh, as the past is less of a guide to the future um, than with macroeconomic uh, extreme events. I mean, not only do we not know the future course of emissions, which will determine the amount of physical risk we have to cope with and adapt to, we don't know how policies will respond, and so we don't know the degree of transition risk either. But we do know that we will experience both over the coming years, and that they will be more uh, serious the longer that we delay action. Now at GARP, we've just completed our third annual survey of climate risk management in financial firms. Uh, that's largely banks, asset managers and insurers. And I was struck by a few statistics. So for example, 80% of the firms, and bear in mind, these are some of the largest financial institutions in the world, 80% of them have regulators who've published formal expectations about climate risk management. Um, only 6% of the respondents thought that climate risk was properly priced. Um, and <clears throat> where it is being priced was uh, in, a, in a few uh, pockets like emerging market sovereigns, uh, green bond prices and some lines of insurance. So the risk is building up, it's not being priced, um, and that is of quite a lot of concern to those working in the financial markets. Why is it not being priced? Well, basically because there's a, a lack of good quality data, we've not got the right models or methodologies, and it's incredibly complex as well. Um, but today, there's a bit of context there from a risk management perspective. Um, we have a fantastic panel that's going to be providing more insights into many of the policy perspectives, which is of critical importance to those working in finance um, and the rest of the economy, of course, particularly when you think about aspects such as carbon pricing, which is such a critical tool, um, impacts on trade and that low carbon emission, thinking how climate risk uh, could impact on macro financial stability. So I'm delighted to interview um, and introduce the, the three panelists. We're gonna start off with Ian Parry, who's the principal environmental fiscal policy expert in the IMF's fiscal affairs department, uh, specializing in fiscal analysis of climate change, environment and, in, and energy issues. And before joining the fund in 2010, Ian held the Alan V. Nees Chair in Environmental Economics at Resources for the Future. Uh, and then we're going to turn to Beata Yavorachit, I think I've said that wrong, but uh, Chief Economist of the EBRD, who's on leave from the University of Oxford, where she holds a statutory professorship in economics, the first woman in that position, and is fellow of All Souls College. She's a member of the Royal Economic Society's Executive Committee and a director of the International Trade Programme at the Centre for Economic Policy Research in London. She holds a PhD in economics from Yale and a BA in economics from the University of Rochester. And before taking up a position at Oxford, she worked at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where she focused on research, lending operations and policy advice. Um, and then we come to Igor Zuccardi, who was until recently a financial sector economist in the finance competitiveness and innovation global practice at the World Bank, where he was a member of the macro financial risk initiative of the practice. 
and conducts economic analysis in topics of macro financial stability and development. He's also worked in international institutions such as the IMF, the ECB, the IDB and the Central Bank of Colombia. Um, and he's published in the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Maryland in uh, the US. So um, amazing array of talent and experience there and uh, nicely complementary uh, perspectives, I hope. So what we thought we'd do is the structure of the session. Each panelist has around 10 minutes to give a presentation. Uh, a couple of them will use slides. And then uh, if you want to ask questions, just type them into the Q&A uh, box at the, at, the, at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to be monitoring those and we'll take some, if there are some pressing questions, um, we'll take them at the end of each presentation, but we, we do want to make sure that we finish within the hour. So keep your questions short and punchy, because if they're too long, I'm just going to ignore them. Um, and then we'll wrap up at the end with a, a, with a few reflections from the panellists and any uh, outstanding questions that, that we wanted them to take. So Ian, uh, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to, to kick us off. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So uh, the last window of opportunity to keep alive the possibility of containing warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius is closing. Unless global greenhouse gases are cut by 25 to 50 percent below 2019 levels by 2030. The Paris Agreement uh, is working in the sense that 195 parties have signed the agreement and many countries, over 50, uh, have made pledges for uh, net zero emissions by mid-century. But the Paris Agreement by itself is uh, insufficient. Even if countries fully achieved their mitigation pledges for 2030, this would only be cutting global emissions by two thirds of the emissions reductions that are consistent even with a two degrees Celsius uh, target. And there's no mechanism for ensuring that even these uh, mitigation pledges will be fully achieved. We think that carbon pricing has a central role in mitigation policy, provides across the board incentives to reduce energy use and shift towards cleaner fuels. It's cost effective. It establishes the price signal that's critical for redirecting new investment towards clean technologies, mobilizes a valuable source of revenue, Gen it can generate significant domestic environmental co-benefits like reductions in local air pollution mortality, and it can be straightforward from an administrative perspective. But it is important to get the design basics uh, right. Uh, ideally, pricing would cover emissions from the power industry household and transportation sector. Ideally, prices would be predictable and ramp up uh, insofar as possible in line with countries' mitigation commitments. And ideally, the revenues from carbon pricing would be used in a way that's both equitable and uh, productive that boosts the economy. For example, lowering the burden of uh, taxes on labor and capital or funding investments for sustainable development goals. Carbon taxes are a Natural carbon pricing instrument, carbon taxes are charges on the carbon content of a fossil fuel supply. They provide a certainty over future emissions prices. The revenues accrue directly to the government and they can easily build off existing fuel tax collections. So all we're talking about is integrating carbon charges into existing road fuel taxes and extending similar charges to the supply of other petroleum products, natural gas and coal. Emissions trading systems can have similar benefits if they include price stability mechanisms like our price floors and if the allowances are auctioned. Although to date, uh, often trading systems have been limited to the power and industry sector, and they're not going to be a practical option for some countries, for example, countries with limited institutional capacity. We are seeing growing momentum for carbon pricing. There are now 64 carbon pricing mechanisms 30 of them at the uh, national level. And just this year, we've seen major pricing in initiatives launched in Germany and China. Prices in the uh, EU emissions trading system have increased to over 70 uh, US dollars per ton. And Canada has committed to uh, raising its carbon price to 135 US dollars per ton by 2030. 
Nonetheless, only about a fifth of global emissions are priced at the moment, and averaging over all global emissions, the uh, carbon price is only $3 per tonne. Carbon pricing would have a significant impact on uh, energy prices. For example, a $50 per tonne carbon price in 2030 would, on average across G20 countries, increase coal prices 170%, increase natural gas prices 50%, increase electricity prices 40%, and increase retail gasoline prices about 15%. The carbon prices that are implicit uh, in, in countries' mitigation pledges for 2030 vary quite considerably uh, across G20 countries. A number of G20 countries will need carbon prices well above $75 per ton to meet their mitigation commitments. For example, in uh, China, France, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, United Kingdom, United States. Uh, in this figure, the red diamonds are indicating how much uh, countries are pledged to cut emissions, and then the bars are indicating emissions reductions induced by carbon pricing of $25, $50, and $75 a tonne. In other cases, um, uh, prices of uh, well below $25 per tonne uh, will be needed, for example, in China. And in some cases, um, mitigation pledges are not actually binding at present, for example, India, Russia, South Africa, and Turkey. And these differences in the um, implicit carbon prices reflect not only differences in the stringency of countries' uh, mitigation pledges, but also differences in the price responsiveness of emissions across countries. If countries were to implement significant carbon pricing, this would be mobilizing significant amounts of uh, revenue. For example, a $50 per tonne carbon tax in 2030 would typically mobilize revenues of between 0.5 and 2% of GDP for most G20 countries, and around 3% of GDP in emissions intensive uh, countries. In this figure, the red bars are the uh, economic efficiency costs of a $50 per tonne carbon price in 2030. That's mostly reflecting the annualized costs of, the, uh, uh, of switching to uh, more expensive but cleaner technologies. And these are, aren't too large, uh, are around 0.5% of GDP for uh, emissions intensive countries and substantially less than that uh, in other cases. But the blue diamonds are the domestic environmental co-benefits of uh, carbon pricing, reductions in local air pollution mortality, reductions in traffic congestion and accident externalities, minus the pure economic efficiency costs. And these net benefits tend to be about zero or moderately positive in most cases, and substantially positive in uh, cases uh, with uh, severe local air pollution problems like China, India, and Russia. So most countries can, in fact, move ahead unilaterally with carbon pricing and up to a point make themselves better off before even counting the global climate benefits. We think that uh, carbon pricing should be the centerpiece of uh, most countries' mitigation strategies, but it needs to be supported by a number of other key elements. These include reinforcing instruments at the um, sectoral level, debates and regulations, which I'll mention more in a moment, uh, public investment in uh, uh, clean infrastructure networks that would not be provided by the private sector, productive and equitable use of the carbon pricing revenues to help build support for the uh, program, just transition measures to assist low-income households, displaced workers, uh, vulnerable uh, regions, measures to address uh, industrial competitiveness, perhaps border adjustments, and the pricing of broader emissions sources beyond the energy sector, for example, in forestry and agriculture. So just to elaborate a bit on that reinforcing sectoral instruments, these are needed because of constraints on the political acceptability of carbon pricing because of its impact on raising energy prices and imposing burdens on them, households and firms. So here we would recommend policymakers consider uh, fee baits, which are the uh, fiscal analog of uh, emission rate uh, regulations. 
fee rates provide a revenue neutral sliding scale of uh, fees on products or activities with above average emissions intensity and a sliding scale of uh, rebates for products or activities with below average uh, emission rates. And they have a number of attractions. First of all, they can promote all of the behavioral responses for reducing the emissions intensity of a particular sector, but they won't generate a demand response. So for example, in the transportation sector, fee rates can shift people to cleaner vehicles, but unlike carbon pricing, they will reduce uh, overall vehicle miles traveled. In addition, fee rates are automatically cost-effective across the responses they promote, unlike uh, emission rate regulations, which are only cost-effective if they contain uh, extensive credit trading provisions. Fee rates also avoid a new fiscal cost on the government because they are revenue neutral, unlike, for example, subsidies for uh, electric vehicles or renewables. And fee rates do not impose a new tax burden on the average household or firm, unlike carbon pricing, because they do not involve the pass-through of carbon tax revenue or allowance rent in higher energy prices. And finally, fee rates are compatible with existing regulations, for example, emission rate standards for vehicles. In fact, they provide ongoing incentives for all firms to uh, uh, exceed current regulations. And we have seen fee rates integrated into vehicle tax systems in a number of countries, but the same instrument could be applied to the power sector, the industry sector, the building sector, and the forestry sector. Just finally here, um, we, we think that um, an, at the international level, a new uh, international mechanism is needed, is essential to uh, complement and reinforce the uh, Paris Agreement. In fact, under the Paris Agreement, it's just very difficult for countries when they're acting unilaterally to aggressively scale up their mitigation policy due to concerns about impacts on their industrial competitiveness and uncertainty about whether other countries will free ride and fulfill their mitigation commitments. So we recommend a new international uh, mechanism, which has two key elements. First of all, is it focused on a small number of large emitting countries, uh, both to facilitate negotiation and to cover the majority of global emissions. For example, if, if China, India, the US, and the EU were in this arrangement, this would be covering nearly two thirds of uh, baseline global emissions in 2030. While if the whole of the G20 is in the arrangement, that would be covering 85% of our global emissions. And the second key element is a focus on a minimum carbon price that participants must implement because that's an efficient and easily understood parameter. Simultaneous action amongst the large emitting countries to scale up carbon pricing would be the best way to address concerns about our competitiveness and free riding. But we think this arrangement would need to be designed pragmatically. Firstly, to accommodate the principle of our differentiated responsibilities for developing countries. And that might be done by um, differentiating price floor requirements according to a country's level of economic development and or uh, combining simple transfer mechanisms with the arrangement to transfer financial and technological assistance to uh, low-income emerging market economies. And in addition, the arrangement needs to be designed flexibly to accommodate countries that are not going to do carbon pricing, so long as they achieve equivalent emissions outcomes through other policies that they would have achieved had they met the uh, price floor. And it's just striking how effective this type of price floor arrangement could be. If, for example, uh, high uh, advanced countries were subject to a price floor of $75 per tonne in 2030, High income emerging market economies like China, price floor of $50 per ton, and low income emerging market economies like India, a price floor of $25 per ton, then that would be sufficient to get G20 emissions in, in 2030 in line with keeping global warming below two degrees Celsius, even if there are just six participants in the price floor. 
China, India, the US, the EU, Canada, and the UK. That is assuming that our other G20 countries meet their current Paris mitigation pledges and countries that are in the price floor either meet the price floor or their mitigation pledge, whichever is the more stringent. Thank you, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. We have a very disciplined audience. No one's actually asked any questions. I think it was so lucid. And um, I guess, Ian, I, I did want to ask you, I mean, how many years have you been working on carbon pricing? And so why, why are we still not doing it? Is it because of the political reality? Uh, yeah, well, well actually, uh, um, I, I did my uh, thesis on uh, carbon pricing uh, in uh, 1993 at the University of Chicago, so a long time, actually. Um, but, but I think, um, you know, domestically, there are, there are these two big obstacles to carbon pricing. Uh, it, because it does increase energy prices, it imposes burdens on households, uh, and it imposes burdens on firms. So that's why we emphasize uh, that a comprehensive strategy is needed. Uh, you need to uh, put the revenues back in the economy in, in ways that can help build the support for the program. Perhaps in some countries that's cutting uh, burdens and taxes on uh, labor, perhaps, perhaps cutting some taxes on business. In other countries that can't mobilize significant revenue for other, from other fiscal instruments due to high informality, perhaps uh, that they need the extra revenue to fund investments for sustainable development goals. So you can help build support for the program by using the revenues um, judiciously. Uh, you, you need to worry about displaced workers and vulnerable regions and low income households and, and make sure there are proper assistance measures in place for them. And we need to worry about impacts on industrial competitiveness, whether that's through border carbon adjustments um, or other measures. Uh, but we do think um, it's very difficult for countries when they're acting unilaterally to scale up action. And that's why we put so much emphasis on introducing a new international policy coordination regime. Uh, you know, we have our own proposal, which we think is the most pragmatic and practical, but um, other, others are suggesting similar international coordination regimes. For example, the German government is proposing a, a similar sort of a climate club. Um, and you know, this is all uh, what well, the ability of one country to move forward on carbon pricing depends so much on what's happening in other countries. So um, there are a lot of carbon pricing schemes, but uh, the prices are very low at the moment. They need to uh, uh, rapidly increase the prices. But you know, if, the, if prices in the EU are rising, if, if there's a significant price in China, Canada raises it, its price, this, this helps to create a international momentum and uh, catalyze action. So yeah. Um, we've got a, we have got a couple of questions, actually. Um, how would your assessment of the efficacy of carbon taxes change if the cost of renewable energy drops well below fossil fuel? Um, and also, what's your view on removing subsidies for fossil fuel use? I mean, presumably it's all part of the same package. You know, you've got to get those relative prices working in the right direction to get the incentives right, but if you've got time to answer those. Yeah, so um, if, if the costs of renewables fell faster, effectively that uh, increases the uh, behavioral responses to carbon pricing. So now there's, it creates bigger shifting away from uh, fossil fuels to renewables uh, as the costs of renewables come down. So I should have mentioned that another key element of the mitigation strategy, at least for uh, large, uh, wealthier countries is to a, uh, a focus on develop advancing critical technologies, but whether that's uh, renewables, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, uh, battery storage for storing intermittent power supply and so on. So that needs to be uh, part of the mitigation package and that will help increase the uh, effectiveness or behavioral responses to carbon pricing. And then on energy subsidies, actually, we just uh, a report came out uh, of ours uh, last week, which is updating our estimates of um, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, these are amount to $5.9 trillion globally, so 6.5, 6.8% of global GDP in 2020. Um, only, only about 8% of that is reflecting undercharging for supply costs. 
the huge bulk of it is representing undercharging for the environmental costs of uh, fossil fuels, not just the carbon emissions, but uh, local air pollution and uh, other externalities. So just, re just reforming uh, this narrow measure of fossil fuels, uh, getting prices to reflect supply costs, is not going to reduce global emissions much, only about 2%. It, it's when we start pricing in the carbon damages, uh, other externalities, we get much bigger increases in energy prices and a much deeper reduction in global emissions. Okay, that, that was that was really clear. Thanks very much. There's actually quite a lot for us to to come back to, um, probably. So I I want to turn. I'm going to have another go at your name, Piata Yavorchik. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> I think I said it too quickly. Uh, let me let me give you the floor um, and and uh, do share us your views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. So let me share the perspective of countries where the EBRD operates, and I think this will partially speak to the question of on why it's so difficult uh, to engage in carbon pricing and in other measures um, designed to make progress with low carbon transition. So if I think about countries where we are active, I can think of three groups of countries. So we operate in the new EU member states like Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. These countries um, are expected to comply with the ambitious commitments made by the European Union. And they will certainly benefit from the funding that the EU is providing for that purpose. Then we have countries in the broadly defined European neighborhood. So think about Ukraine, Western Balkans, or North Africa. These countries uh, will be affected by the proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism. The EU is an important export market for them. Um, their exports tend to be energy intensive and um, they are likely to be subject to that additional tax. And then we have the third group of countries which are hydrocarbon producers. So think about Russia and Azerbaijan. If we as the world make a lot of progress in low carbon transition, oil prices are going to drop and that's going to hit these countries quite hard, particularly countries that like Russia have a high cost of oil extraction. But in the short run, while the demand for hydrocarbons is still there, while the prices are still quite high, they actually may benefit um, because Western companies are under a lot of pressure to divest uh, from hydrocarbons while um, in many of those countries, there is no such pressure. So if you think about the news from last week about Shell having to, uh, being forced by a, call, by a court decision um, to divest from some of their activities, um, they actually sold uh, rights to some of the shale fields um, in the US as a result of that. Now, one of the biggest challenges for the countries where we operate is the reliance on coal. So first, coal mining. More than a third of Mongolia's exports in 2019 uh, were constituted of coal. Um, coal miners uh, are a well-defined group and you know, it is easy for governments to compensate them if you close coal mining. Uh, but of course, uh, it's not just the issue of coal miners, the regional ecosystem in many um, subnational regions is geared to support the industry. Um, so you certainly need to worry not just about the coal miners, but the local economy. Um, and in some countries, if you look at the direct employment in coal mines, as well as in direct employment, it's quite significant. It's two and a half percent of total employment in Kazakhstan and two per, sorry, it's two, per, two and a half percent in Bosnia and Herzegovina and two percent in Kazakhstan. So that's you know quite a bit chunk of, of employment. Um, two weeks ago, I was speaking to the mayor of the Polish city of Zabrze and she mentioned to me that her town, her city already had the closure of coal mines behind it 
they closed 12 mines. They were facing for a period of time 25% unemployment rate. But now they are bracing themselves for other regions, for neighboring regions going through the same transformation. So there are these regional spillovers within countries. Now, the, the second challenge related to coal is that a large share of electricity in many of these countries comes from coal. So that is true. So for instance, three quarters of electricity production is linked to coal in Mongolia, in Poland, and in Moldova. Now, if you think about EU member states such as Poland, that means that as carbon prices are increasing, the energy mix may make manufacturing in those countries um, not very competitive. Um, and that's quite of a challenge because many post-communist countries have a higher share of manufacturing in GDP than other countries of similar income levels. And that's something that served them very well during the pandemic and the current recovery phase, but um, their energy mix uh, will be problematic in the face of higher carbon prices. Now, in the countries outside of the EU, um, this energy mix and uh, high intensity, energy intensity of exports means that the carbon border adjustment mechanism will be a significant factor. If you think about carbon intensity of steel production, in Russia, it's three times High, it's three times of the intensity in the European Union. Um, in Kazakhstan, it's twice as high as in the European Union. And um, you know, if you think about, for instance, smaller Western Balkan countries, they send vast majority of their exports to the EU. So there is relatively little scope for changing the direction of exports. But of course, you know, there are also bright spots. Think about Albania. 90% of electricity there comes from renewables. Um, this country has a free trade agreement with the EU, so they could rebrand themselves as a green manufacturing hub. The third challenge related to coal is usage of coal for heating of houses. Um, so here, you know, these are houses, households purchasing coal and using it in heating devices they have in their homes. Um, Poland, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia have a higher direct consumption of coal by households per globally. Um, so changing that means um, that households will have to change the heating system. So a large number of people will be directly affected by this. Now, What's also very clear is that there is limited awareness among firms of the need to change. In 2018 and 19, we surveyed about 20,000 firms in countries where we operate, and we asked them, if you haven't engaged in investments um, aimed at improving energy efficiency, why is that? 60%, 60% of firms said it is not a priority relative to other investments. And lack of access to financing was a distant second. It, uh, you know, it was less than 15%, one five of firms were saying this was the reason. So there are these information asymmetries. Firms do not realize um, that the change is coming, that they will need to adjust. And also, they do not realize that potentially uh, investments in their energy saving could be quite profitable. So obviously, there is scope here for government intervention, uh, for instance, um, mandating or, and subsidizing energy audits. Now, of course, if you look at differences in awareness um, of firms, and for instance, if you ask whether they think about green issues, whether they engage in gray, green management, the differences are huge within countries. And these within country differences are larger than differences across countries. What you see is that foreign affiliates and exporters are quite sophisticated when it comes to uh, green management. Um, and they cite 
pressure of consumers, mostly in foreign markets, um, as well as government regulations. These are two factors that matter very much for whether or not firms engage in green management. So here, the carbon border adjustment mechanism um, may play quite an important role because if it affects exporters, exporters will have an incentive to lobby their own governments to introduce uh, equal or similar regulation so that in the domestic market, exporters are not undercut by other producers who are not subject um, to the same taxes or to the same uh, requirements. Now, of course, there is a lot happening in the green space, and I'm happy to report that the EBRD is very actively engaged in supporting a low carbon transition. We think of ourselves as a green bank. So just to give you some examples, um, we, we invested half a billion dollars in Egypt to um, support construction of the largest solar farm on the African continent. Uh, we spent quarter of a billion euros to support construction of a battery giga manufacturing facility um, in Poland. Um, we supported the first sustainability linked bond in Greece, a high yield bond where the local energy uh, producer, local electricity company committed to cutting their CO2 emissions by 40% by end of next year. And if they do not attain this goal, the interest rate they will have to pay uh, will have to will increase. So a lot is happening, but much more support is needed, as well as the appreciation of the transition cost. And in particular, there is a lot of support needed to shelter um, workers who will be affected, as well as low income households. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was uh, very thought provoking indeed. I mean, it it sort of um, highlights just some of these tensions that we've got when you think about broader um, more like the SDGs, not just about climate, but the, the trade offs we're going to face with uh, growth and uh, and climate. Um, we have a, a question here, actually, about do you think they will that the uh, border border carbon adjustment what, what do you think the impact will be on on global trade and fdi if fdi and could the adjustment lead to a sort of tit for tat retaliation so the as um as ian mentioned um what in his presentation um the issue is competitiveness, right? It's very difficult for countries to do anything alone because they are worried about, they are worried about undermining their competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis imports. Um, so one, will, one needs to think of resolving this issue. So obviously the best, the first best solution would be for every country to commit um, to taking steps towards uh, low carbon transition. But in the absence of that, um, there is carbon border adjustment tax is one way of, of dealing with this issue. So my hope is that there will be no tit for tat, that um, COP26 is going to result in very ambitious um, commitments. Now, but to come back to this issue of what this carbon border adjustment tax, if or when it, it comes uh, into play, what it will mean for trade, I think it may lead to relocation of uh, production of supply chains towards places where renewable energy is available, where there's a lot of it, and where one could argue that there are similar, uh, that carbon is priced in a similar way so that one could get exemption from the tax. Um, and I think this may be a powerful force um, that will direct or redirect trade and FDI flows. Mm. Great, okay, we're well, just mindful of the time. 
Thank you for that. Um, Igor, I think we're going to we're going to go to you next and um, to the audience do keep your questions coming. Um, over to you, Igor. Uh, thank you very much, Joy. Um, thank you very much for this invitation to this uh, uh, panel discussion about fiscal policy and climate change. Uh, next, um, as uh, uh, next, next slide, please. As uh, Ian and the and other panel members have said, uh, carbon pricing mechanisms are, are key for the achievement of low carbon economy, particularly because carbon pricing is the most cost-effective mechanism to reach the, uh, the Paris agreements of a reduction of CO2 and uh, greenhouse um, um, uh, gas uh, uh, emissions. Also because carbon prices send signals to the economic cost of uh, emissions uh, and they create incentives for action to transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, carbon pricing as a form of uh, tax taxes or ETS systems can be a source for the government's revenue um, yeah, that could be used for public infrastructure, social investment, for uh, research and development, green technology, of all elements that are needed for adapting and mitigating uh, um, the, tra the transition to a low carbon economy. And as, uh, as explained by, by Ian, uh, there is a, a, a international coordination for carbon pricing is key for the success of the of the of the of the Paris Agreement or the reduction of, uh, of emissions, but the, the elements of this uh, coordination are still uh, under discussion or still uh, they, they are, as you say uh, you saw in the in the in the in the discussion the still elements of border uh, border um, tariffs and everything like that uh, have been discussed. Uh, next. Yes. Even though the, important, the importance of this carbon price mechanism, there is still a room to grow for the adoption of those mechanisms. Only 64 um, in, uh, jurisdictions among countries, provinces, and cities have some kind of, a mechani of some kind of mechanism. Uh, in particular, uh, key players in the effort for, for, for reduction of emissions uh, have not yet uh, 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 adopted a price mechanism, particularly the United States with 13.4% of the global emissions, uh, India with 6.5% of uh, global emissions. Uh, uh, China, for instance, just joined uh, this club of, uh, of, of countries uh, in January 2021. So, uh, uh, there is still uh, uh, room for this uh, growth, particularly in emerging and developing countries. And also, it's important to consider that uh, uh, it's, in, uh, 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 it's necessary to improve the role of, uh, of uh, pricing mechanisms as a signal for transition and process. Currently, the global carbon price is around three dollars per ton of CO2 emissions that are uh, very low uh, for the for the and incongruent with the with the necessity of uh, of reaching a temperature below two uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, the branch range the range it should be around forty to eighty percent of the, the the tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, next, but I just want to the um, mechanism as a part of policy transition and this uh, uh, and because of the of the, of this uh, the uh, carbon price mechanism could have important implications uh, for the economy to do the interlinkages between transition risk and macro financial outcomes in particular uh, what we, i call a uh, transition risk is uncertainty that is generated by the transition to the low uh, low carbon economy particularly uh, 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 changes in policies a adoption of new technologies of, of uh, changes in, 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 in consumer preference. Uh, this kind of transition risk could have effects on, for instance, uh, carbon intensive sectors could, uh, that could face uh, changes in their asset value due to uh, higher production costs, uh, uh, for competitiveness, or the changes in the energy mix. Also, uh, this kind of uh, uh, transition uh, risk uh, generate risk because they uh, change the balance sheets of uh, private and public uh, uh, agents. Particularly, uh, they change the or they encourage the shift of uh, of private consumption and investment uh, uh, decisions uh, in, in for those those uh, um, actors. 
Um, one of the elements that is important is that uh, this is a, a, a two-way a two um, um, uh, um, uh, loop in terms that the weak uh, macro financial conditions are also uh, uh, also affects uh, the, tra the transition process because uh, countries that who, uh, that have a transition macro financial con uh, weak that have ma weak macro financial condition uh, are, have limits to to the capability to 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 invest in a successful transition process. Uh, next. This is particularly important uh, for uh, uh, some developing countries uh, because understanding these implications uh, are, uh, are key for countries that could face the, what we call double jeopardy of high macro financial vulnerability and high, ma high macro uh, or high climate related risk associated with transition. Uh, in this uh, slide, I try to show uh, uh, some of the results that we uh, uh, published in a, in a paper recently uh, in the World Bank, in which we identified the countries that could face difficulties to the transition due to the fact that their economies are very uh, uh, CO2 intensive uh, and they have little uh, macro or fiscal space for a transition or the banking sector are uh, face of vulnerabilities and are not a, a, a channel for a resource mobilization of the transition. Uh, in, uh, as you can see, the, the, the transition process could be, it, it could, it, it, it could have an heterogeneous impact across the across developing countries and is particularly important in, in the Middle East of uh, Middle East and North Africa in, in Latin America. And in East Asia, in sorry, in uh, Europe and in Central Asia, uh, both for macro risk, banking risk, and uh, and uh, debt risk. Um, next, this is also important for uh, countries that uh, uh, are uh, net uh, fossil fuel exports, um, uh, because the um, uh, uh, the uh, global transition to a low carbon economy. And, uh, 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 to look for alternatives for foreign exchange and the fiscal revenue. Uh, also, they have to transform their, their economies that in, in which many of the of, of, of these economies have developed down downstream carbon intensive uh, uh, industries. So uh, uh, here uh, again, I show that, for instance, a uh, uh, Countries in Sub-Saharan Africa or region like Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa, uh, they could be very strongly impacted by the by the transition in terms of uh, exports uh, and uh, Latin America, uh, Europe and Central Asia uh, also have could have non uh, a very a very important uh, uh, impacts on on that. Uh, next. Even though the, the importance of of of, 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 deep, of a deep understanding of this uh, macro financial implication of uh, climate risk and particularly transition and fiscal risk, uh, it, it, uh, there are initiatives that are initiatives around the world are still ongoing. Uh, uh, I put the example that is has been like a, 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 a recently the, 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 there is a lot of attention recently about the. Uh, climate uh, risk impacts on uh, financial stability, and uh, for instance, uh, since 2019, uh, most of the initiatives that try to understand the channels and the and the and the interlinkages between climate risk and uh, financial sector have been developed by uh, EU uh, central banks or authorities around 18 uh, institutions. Uh, only eight, uh, 18 initiatives, sorry, uh, around 15 initiatives has been uh, or are in the process in non-EU uh, uh, institutions uh, like the IMF, uh, the Central Bank of UK or the Bank of England has developed a, a very strong uh, um, 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 framework on this, but other, other countries are still in process of planning uh, this, uh, this kind of initiatives. Uh, in particular, um, the, uh, this, uh, this initiative uh, have, have pay attention to the have paying attention to the to the to modeling transition and, and physical risk because of the non-linearities of the of the of these two types of risk 
and also putting a lot of in, in, in interest in uh, moving to uh, firm level data and models because uh, because of the capacity of this kind of uh, uh, frameworks and initiatives to uh, capture hetero heterogeneous impacts on uh, across sector uh, inside of sector or over time. What are the main difficulties or challenges that uh, um, that emerging economies and developing countries have in order to 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 conduct this kind of initiative or to understand to better understand their their own uh, macro financial and uh, climate risk interlinkages? First, the cover quality of the information. Uh, uh, it's difficult in many emerging and developing countries to find a uh, firm level CO2 emission in intensity information. Uh, also, a uh, quantification of interlinkages between uh, 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 climate and, and macro are still difficult to understand at the level of, uh, uh, of, the, of the country. And in general, in this, in this, uh, on all these kind of models, uh, the in model, the technical difficulty to. Uh, capture the, um, the the interaction between a uh, transition and physical risk are uh, still uh, there. Next, but even though these caveats and these uh, issues, um, uh, these kind of models and these kind of uh, uh, frameworks are power, powerful tools to for analysis of the macro financial impacts of climate change. And uh, and I put the uh, example of the recent uh, exercise uh, conducted by the ECD on climate uh, on climate uh, risk uh, stress test, uh, in which uh, using uh, for uh, for one looking uh, scenarios analysis, these kind of uh, models, uh, firm level models, have the capacity to recognize that the transition policy. Uh, can affect the cost of firms uh, structure and the, in particular for carbon intensive firms. Uh, for instance, in this in this um, um, slide, I want I would like to show that uh, these kind of models are able to uh, recognize changes in the in the in uh, in the stock in the balance sheet and the structure of a. Uh, of uh, non-financial firms across uh, sectors, uh, even inside of the sectors, and and can and informs about the heterogeneity of the of, of the of the of climate shocks uh, across uh, across uh, the industries, and also uh, inform in the in the right hand side, they informs about the the timing or the, uh, the how the, the the impacts of the of this kind of a uh, of uh, uh, policy. Decisions uh, have over have over time. For instance, uh, uh, the cost of orderly transitions in short term versus the long term effects on 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 or long term benefits of orderly transition against the business as usual or a, a disorderly transition process. Uh, next. Uh, as uh, the main uh, uh, takeaways of this uh, of my presentation is that uh, of course carbon pricing mechanisms are important for for uh, um, reaching the uh, Paris Agreement goals, uh, but uh, still there is a room for uh, improving uh, to, to for adopting this kind of mechanism and improving the signals of uh, price signals of, uh, of uh, for the transition process. Uh, but it's important to consider that uh, 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 as a part of the whole transition process, carbon price mechanisms have impacts on the, uh, on macro financial uh, outcomes uh, through the through uh, different channels uh, that uh, have to be well understood, uh, particular in emerging and developing countries. Uh, uh, those uh, that uh, Face the double jeopardy of transi transition of macro financial risk. Uh, however, so far, uh, some uh, is a, uh, the, the the stock of initiatives uh, regarding this um, um, of uh, understanding this kind of uh, uh, interlinkages is still limited, uh, particularly concentrated in, in in advanced economies, and this is felt, but they are powerful. Uh, um, um, tools to in, understand the heterogeneity and the ti uh, timing of this process of transition. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, 
That was, that was, I mean, great presentations from all the three of you. Thank you very much. Um, just mindful of the time and mindful of the complexity of some of these issues. Um, I also, I wanted to kind of round up really with, with a few thoughts. We've got COP26 starting quite soon. We've also got COP15. We haven't actually talked about biodiversity. Um, you know, it's not just about climate, unfortunately. We have so many challenges and what you've talked about uh, collectively is, is the important, the critical importance of carbon tax, the price mechanism allowing um, income and substitution effects to work the way they should, uh, but mindful of the just transition kind of impacts and distributional impacts and the political reality as well. Um, it's clear that policy uh, needs to change but given all of this, and given that we haven't been terribly successful so far, how optimistic are you that we are going to see meaningful action uh, coming out of COP26 in a few weeks' time? And let me start with you, Igor, because I didn't get time to ask you uh, any in-depth uh, questions about your presentation. Well, um, thank you for the question. Um, I cannot say about the uh, what uh, what what uh, if I am optimistic or pessimistic regarding the the outcome of the of the of the COP twenty twenty six because uh, um, uh, there are several political economy elements to to consider uh, as explained by Ian and uh, and Beate uh, elements like uh, competitiveness cost of uh, energy uh, are uh, um, associated with these uh, with these um, negotiations um, um, as uh, Ian said um, the key players like the United States China India uh, 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 the EU UK and Canada are the ones that uh, that can make a, a the, the process or the uh, well, at, at least the carbon pricing mechanism uh, uh, work uh, to, to to or to be congruent to the reduction of of, of emissions uh, um, congruent to the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, consequently, uh, we have to see um, uh, there is a willingness from the U.S. Uh, 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 from the Biden administration there is willingness to uh, go through this uh, uh, um, um, agenda. Uh, as you see, China just joined the ETS system, so there is an interest. But uh, uh, India, we don't know exactly. Uh, but but it's important, and my emphasis on on the presentations is the is is the importance to understand uh, how this uh, kind of mechanism affects. Uh, 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 macro financial conditions in, in, in those countries, and based on that, they can discuss uh, uh, particularly goals. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Beata, how about you? Are you optimistic? Well, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, politicians have an incentive to make ambitious commitments, but push all the necessary action into the future. It's a bit like St. Augustine who said, Lord, give me chastity and continence, just not yet. So I'm really hopeful that at COP26, politicians will be able to overcome their St. Augustine moment and actually start acting now. Thank you. Mm, love the quote. Ian. <laughs> um, well, so, I mean, the, the four big emitters of the EU, the US, China, and India. And the EU's made strong uh, commitments and is moving seriously on, on, on aggressive policies. So the EU is okay. Um, the US has made very ambitious commitments, but um, there's a huge policy gap in the United States and it remains to be seen whether uh, adequate policies will be put in place. And even if they are, whether they might get reversed if, if uh, the White House changes uh, next time. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the US. And China and India, well, you know, to be honest, uh, their commitment, uh, their ambition is way below where it needs to be. Uh, but, but those, those, those are the countries that need to scale up their ambition in, in a way that they view as fair. Maybe for India, that's part of a deal that involves significant technological and financial uh, assistance to help them with the, their uh, uh, clean energy transition. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainties, um, but 
you know, there are also reasons for optimism. It's in none of these um, countries' interests to lock the planet into warming above two degrees Celsius, which we will do if those four, if those four players don't, uh, uh, you know, cut their emissions significantly over the next decade. So it's in their self-interest to uh, come together. Um, they, you know, for China and India, there are also big um, local health uh, benefits from uh, cutting back on fossil fuels. So it, it, it's all very, and, and you know, if, if um, the US and uh, the EU and China could, could move, then it makes it India easier for India to move. So there's a lot of uh, interdependency as well. So I know it's all very uncertain, but you could see, you could see an optimistic scenario where um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, catalyzing action. Mm. Well, I think it's important to have some degree of optimism. Otherwise, you know, we really do just give up, don't we? Um, and I do think we've made huge progress in terms of our understanding of the policy options that need to be uh, employed. I just want to thank you all for a great panel, a great discussion. Um, and I believe that we've got the fifth session of this MMF conference on Friday. And that's with Nobel laureate Bob Engel and uh, Misa Tanaka from the Bank of England. So just remember, you do need to register um, for that at mmf.ac.uk forward slash policy. So I'll leave you with that slide. And uh, yes, thanks very much. Thoroughly enjoyed today's discussion. Um, thank you. <laughs>